Hey YouTubers, this is Lonnie Clark again. That's for art. I'm going to read more of our book, Poison Power. I wanted to show you guys something before I read. The last time I read to you, I was really sick, like super sick. So I went to the store the next day and I bought this. And I'm not kidding you, it got me better at the next day. By the end of the next day, I was 100% better. 100%. So uh, this is a homeopathic remedy. And honestly... We've got to stop relying on the big pharma bullshit. You know, last year I went to the store when I got sick like this and I bought Alka-Seltzer Plus and it exploded in the infection in my lungs and I got double pneumonia. So when I went to the store, I was very afraid to buy anything. But I thought, well, I have all those symptoms and I know homeopathic doesn't hurt me. It may not help. I actually didn't believe it was going to help. I'm always a shocked when homeopathic stuff works. But it did help. And so I wanted to show you this product because I know a lot of people are suffering from colds right now. And this is an awesome product. Basically, I took a tablet. You open it up and you get these little tablets. And here, I'll show you. It comes four packages, right? And I went through one box. There's four to a package. I went through one box already. And then... I took a whole sheet of this plus these two before I got well. And for the first, like, I don't know, eight or nine, ten hours, I was putting two underneath my tongue sublingually and letting them melt for, like, I don't know, every 10 or 15 minutes. Um, every time when you do homeopathics, every time you feel the symptom, you take the medicine. And uh, honestly, it was really astounding. So um, I just wanted to share that with you because it was really freaking awesome. So I'm going to get to our book, Poison Power, by Dr. John Goffman and Arthur Tamplin, The Case Against Nuclear Power. We're on Chapter 8. That chapter is uh, uh, called what? The Nuclear Legacy, Radioactive Waste and Plutonium. We're on page 198, first paragraph. In a talk entitled Plutonium and Public Health, Presented at the University of Colorado at Boulder on April 19, 1970, Donald Giesemann stated, Finally, I would like to describe the problem in larger context. By the year 2000, plutonium-239 has been conjectured to be a major energy source. Commercial projection is projected to at 30 tons per year by 1980, in excess of 100 tons per year, by 2000, plutonium contamination is not an academic question. Unless fission reactor feasibility is demonstrated in the near future, the commitment will be made to liquid metal fast breeder reactors fueled by plutonium. Since fusion reactors are presently speculative, the decision for liquid metal fast breeder reactors should be anticipated and plutonium should be considered as a major pollutant of remarkable toxicity and persistence. Considering the enormous economic inertia involved in the commitment and it's in, it is imperative that public health aspects be carefully and honestly defined prior to active promotion of the industry. To live sanely with plutonium, one must appreciate the potential magnitude of risk and be able to monitor against all significant hazards. Uh, an, in, an indeterminate amount of plutonium has gone off-site at a major facility at the Dow Rocky Flats plant, 10 miles upwind from a metropolitan area of Denver, Colorado. The loss was unnoticed. The origin is somewhat speculative as it is the ultimate, excuse me, the origin is somewhat speculative, as is the ultimate deposition. The health and safety of public and workers are protected by a set of standards for plutonium acknowledged to be meaningless. Such things make a travesty of public health and raise serious questions about a hurried acceptance of nuclear energy, unquote. Although the carcinogenic hazard of plutonium in the environment is a serious problem, there is an even more serious problem associated with plutonium. It can be used to make atomic bombs. Even without the fast breeder program, the cons considerable plutonium is produced in the present day reactors. 
In fact, government purchase of the recovered plutonium is one of the price supports for the nuclear power industry. So the government's purchasing recovered plutonium for its weapons and promoting nuclear power. That's what they're saying. I mean, we know that, but this is, they're stating this in 1972. New subtitle, The Safeguards Problem. Uranium-235 and plutonium-239 have been used to manufacture atomic bombs. Obtaining weapons grades uranium-235 is very difficult because the uranium-235 has to be separated from its chemically identical and much more abundant relative uranium-238. However, plutonium-239 can be separated from its breeding material, uranium-238, by chemical means. The spent fuel elements from a present-day reactor therefore contain, in a relatively easily extractable form, the primary ingredient for the manufacture of atomic bombs, enough to make several bombs. With the spread of nuclear reactors and eventual change to the fast breeder, plutonium will become a, as commonplace as heroin and even more profitable. A, seri a, a serious an unresolved and probably unsolvable problem is how to prevent this plutonium from falling into criminal hands where it can be used for blackmail and black market enterprises. A front page article in the Wall Street Journal of Thursday, June 18, 1968 stated, Scientists are raising a horrendous new possibility. It is far too easy, they say, for a crazed man, a revolutionary, or a criminal to make an atomic bomb. I've been worried about how easy it is to build bombs ever since I built my first one, says Theodore Taylor, a nuclear physicist who headed the Defense Department's atomic bomb design and testing program for seven years. He says the once secret information needed to build nuclear bombs became available in unclassified literature several years ago. In my opinion, that was not an accident. He especially recommends the World Book Encyclopedia for its explanation of how a bomb works. So we just go to the encyclopedia and we figure out how to build a bomb. How great is that? The December 1969 issue of Nuclear News reported on the Nuclear Safeguard Symposium held at the Los Alamos Scientific Laboratory on October 27th through 30th, 1969. The article stated, quote, There was general agreement at the end of the symposium that although there had been good progress made in safeguards technology, the world is still a long way from a foolproof system. In fact, some expressed doubts that this goal would ever be reached. AEC Commissioner Clarence e. Larson, keynote speaker at the symposium's banquet, identified himself with this group when he said, quote, From a practical standpoint, we may never solve all the problems, but we must collectively undertake to find solutions and to make use of safeguard practices, unquote. Uh, this is from Nuclear News. The title of the story is Time May Be Running Out, Safeguards Warning St Sounded, page 16, 1969. Later in the article, the comments made by Mr. C. Bellino of Wright, Long & Company during a panel discussion are reported. Quote, Bellino stole the show. A leading expert in auditing procedures, Bellino serves also as a special investigator to the White House and the FBI. He told the audience that the subject of his treatise was assessing the threat of hijacking by the Mafia. After humorously defining his terms, Bellino became quite serious. He pointed out that a letter was received recently on Capitol Hill stating that Every trucking firm in a certain state, which he did not identify, was mafia-owned and controlled. He noted, too, that out of a secret list of 735 so-called mafia members, 12 are or were owners of trucking firms. Two are truck drivers, and at least nine are or were union officials. 
Bolino believes it is highly probable that if some foreign tyrant offers a deal, U.S. racketeers would be interested in it. A truck carrying uranium or plutonium could easily be hijacked. The theft could just as easily occur at a warehouse or a dock site. Unquote. Representative Craig Hosmer of the Joint Committee on Atomic Energy made the following comments before the 11th annual meeting of the Institute of Nuclear Materials Management in Gatlinburg, Tennessee on May 25, 1970. Quote, Earlier this year, the Attorney General of the United States cited that the Kennedy Airport cargo handling apparatus, excuse me, I'm sorry, I'm going to read that again. Earlier this year, the Attorney General of the United States cited that the Kennedy Airport cargo handling apparatus is being under the control of organized, con organized crime. The same, can, the same can be said of many other key transportation elements of this country, too. When and if special nuclear material ever becomes an article of illicit commerce, the transportation element of the nuclear fuel cycle will be the most vulnerable to diversions. We'd better be cinching up these areas along the way, unquote. Let me read that last sentence. When and if special nuclear material ever becomes an article of illicit commerce, the transportation element of the nuclear fuel cycle will be the most vulnerable to, to diversions. We'd better be cinching up in this area along the way, unquote. And that is still, we are still extremely vulnerable in that area. Many people, including myself, do not regard as very convincing that Dr. Gold that the Dr. Goldfinger scenario where James Bond thwarts holding Miami, holding Miami hostage for a zillion dollar ransom under the threat of blowing it up of a stolen H bomb. Stealing a thousand pound top secret bomb isn't exactly easy. But when you think not in terms of stealing whole bombs, but of diverting very small amounts of special nuclear material at a time and of the possibility of a profitable black market developing, you get on a more credible ground. Black markets already exist from all kinds of hot goods. They are quite flexible in taking on new product lines. If a special nuclear material black market develops, the sale price to some country, individual, or organization desperately wanting to make nuclear explosives has an estimated as, a, as high as 100000 this should be a million dollars, per kilogram. A gram is one one-thousandth of a kilogram. And one one thousandth of one hundred thousand is a thousand dollars. I'm sorry, you guys. Let me read that again. A gram is one one thousandth of a kilogram. And one one thousandth of a hundred thousand dollars is one thousand. Gosh, I, I always get tongue tied whenever I have to read about money, don't I? It's kind of a funny thing. Uh, okay, let's do this again. A gram of one one thousandth of kilogram and one one thousandth of a hundred thousand dollars is a thousand dollars. Liberating a half a gram of plutonium at a time from the first, from the local fast breeder reactor fuel element factory might be so small an amount as to be relatively undetectable even by the best black boxes and the sharpest eyed inspectors. That's from uh, Senator Hosmer, some plain talk on safeguards in Nuclear News, July, page 36, 1970. So you get that's what he's saying. It's like one one thousandth of a gram is worth a thousand dollars. One one thousandth, one one thousandth of a kilogram is worth a thousand dollars. Wow, one one thousandth. No doubt there's a huge black mark on it for it by now. At the 20th 
Pugwash Conference on Science and World Affairs held September 9 through 15, 1970, Drs. Patricia J. Lindop and Joseph Rotblatt of the United Kingdom stated, quote, Finally, when discussing the problems involved in the use of nuclear energy, one must not forget about another and forget an even greater hazard, the possibility of clandestine acquisition by governments or groups of individuals of weapon-grade materials. This will become more and more difficult to avoid as the number and size of nuclear reactors increase. A very efficient system of controls is essential from the beginning. The IAEA has not yet produced convincing evidence that they can tackle this problem, nor has the agency been provided with the funds necessary for a project of this magnitude." Unquote. Plutonium was indeed aptly named Plutonium, the element of the Lord of Hell. What kind of social responsibility exists when men who strongly advocate a drastic increase in worldwide inventory of this element? Yeah, no kidding. What kind of social responsibility exists within men who strongly advocate a drastic increase in a worldwide inventory of this element? Uh, I would say they have no moral responsibility or social responsibility. Back to the book. There are currently acceptable alternatives for electric power generation, and the future holds out great promise for even better means of generating electricity. But, excuse me. There are currently acceptable alternatives for electrical power generation, and the future holds out great promise for even better means of generating electric power. These men would seem to be possessed with a death wish that encompassed all of mankind. Shouldn't they be stopped? Hell yeah, they should be stopped. Why do you think I'm sitting in front of this computer, Dr. Goffman? So we are now on Chapter 9. I'm going to stop here. My apologies for stumbling over the words there. We're on page 204. The next title is called Alternatives Available to Us. Well, evidently... Because it is government funded, the nuclear power industry just dug in their heels and have poisoned the entire planet. So anyways, put your courage feet on, you guys. Um, don't despair. Do learn EFT so that you can, like, not get too depressed or live in despair over this because it's up to us. This is on our watch. We can't stick our heads in the sand any longer. We have to face it. We have to figure out how to reverse this death train that they've got us on. So, ciao, you guys. Put your courage feet on. Bye.